welcome to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, where your co-hosts Dale Yuzuki, Cindy Lawley, and Sarantis Klamidis from Olink Proteomics talk about the intersection of proteomics with genomics for drug target discovery, the application of proteomics to reveal disease biomarkers, and current trends in using proteomics to unlock biological mechanisms. Here we have your hosts, Dale, Cindy, and Sarantis. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Proteomics in Proximity. Today, we have a guest, Chris Whelan, who's joining us from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Chris is the one who has helped spearhead bringing proteomics into the UK biobank. So we're super excited to talk to him about his history, his background, and and what spurred the vision of bringing proteomics together with the genetics that UK Biobank is so famous for, the genetics and clinical data that 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 we're all very excited about on the UK Biobank research analysis platform. And this week is a pretty auspicious week because we've we've just heard that the first tranche of data from the UK Biobank Pharma Proteomics Project uh, have become available through the research analysis platform. So we're excited to talk to Chris about that as well. So welcome, Chris. Hey, Cindy, Dale, Sarantis, how y'all doing? Doing great. It's great to have you with us today. Right. Yeah, Good. for welcome, sure. Welcome, Chris. So, Chris, can you tell us a little bit about your background in terms of uh, going into science? You don't have to start sort of in your elementary school days, but certainly <laughs> sort of uh, your your path to, to industry, because I think that's always an interesting place to start. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I did all of my, my training up to, up to getting my PhD in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I've been told recently that I'm losing my accent, so I'm going to try no, to make an effort to sound more true. Irish today. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I started off in psychology for my undergrad and then realized I wanted to get more into the, uh, the, the cellular sort of, uh, sort of hard, hard science behind uh, brain illnesses. So I did my uh, master's and my PhD in neuroscience. Um, one of my advisors was a geneticist, so I started to, to dip my... Uh, my toes in statistical genetics, um, and that sort of led me towards my postdoc in Los Angeles with the Enigma Consortium at USC. So there they were combining neuroimaging with GWAS, um, basically running, running uh, genome-wide association studies on very large collections of MRI scans. Um, so I did that for two years. Um, Felt that, you know, I always thought that I'd be on the academic track. Um, I remember in my PhD class, they actually wanted to do a straw poll of who wants to go to industry and who wants to be a, a lecturer or a professor. And I was firmly in the professor camp. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I think <laughs> two years in, 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 in academia in the States, uh, it's tough. It's tough. I, I had a, I, and I actually had a good postdoc. My, my PI was awesome really lovely man really supportive but it just gave me some insights into it's it's a it's a tough place to be um and i you know beyond that i think i, I want i i felt that i felt i wanted to be closer to the to the patients that might sound like a little bit of a cliche but i wanted to be really working on you know whatever i'm doing i can see this affecting a patient in you know six or seven years time so um i was going to move home to dublin um and then got the call out of nowhere from uh from Pfizer, and they were looking for somebody who had a, a dual uh, neuroscience and genetics background. So it, it wow. just seemed too perfect to, to uh, ahead to of your out. time. So. Ahead of your time, Chris. So <laughs> when they when they are pulling those GWAS traits out of the imaging data, how are those data being? How is that being tracked? Like like what were the what were the connections you were looking for with the genetic data? Um, how were they identified across different MRIs? that allowed it to be, you know, compared between t cases and controls. It's a, this imaging area has evolved so much since I was in graduate school. So I'm really curious how you did that. So it's interesting. I think Enigma was almost like a, a, a proto UK Biobank. I think UK Biobank was, you know, in the middle of recruitment when Enigma started up, but really it was, it was a great idea from Paul Thompson um, where, you know, it, there were a lot of different sites doing MRI scans and maybe 50 cases or 50 controls and, you know, reporting differences in, in brain structure and function um, that sometimes were replicated and sometimes weren't. So the broad sort of oversimplified idea of Enigma was, um, well, we can't bring everything together. We can't ask everybody to just 
you know, throw their data in a, in a central repository. That would be an you know, ethics and paperwork nightmare. But um, we could agree upon a, a standardized set of, of protocols um, to, to process the imaging data um, and ask everybody to process it in exactly the same way. And then they all send us their results because that's clean, it's, it's, it's anonymized, and we'll meta-analyze all of our results together. So that's where the, uh, the name comes from, uh, enhancing neuroimaging genetics via meta-analysis. Nice. So. Yeah, good memory. <laughs> <laughs> I have to type it out a lot during my first talk. So. <laughs> and, and then how news, did the uh, UK Biobank came to your life? Then? How did you... How did, how did, UK Biobank to your life. How how would you make a connection with UK Biobank? And I think you are you you have also seen all the progress, right? And definitely, yeah. It's interesting. I, I think that UK Biobank came into a lot of uh, um, industry scientists' lives around the same time. Um, you know, while I was at Pfizer, we were using you know large scale genetic databases um, to make inferences around, you know, this gene is associated with this disease, maybe it would make a good therapeutic target. Um, but, but UK Biobank came along, I guess, around, you know, 2017, 2016, 2017, it really started to come onto our radar um, when the exome sequencing of UKB was announced. Um, that was, you know, one of the first sort of major um, industry academic collaborations where UKB worked together with pharma to generate, you know, the biggest um, exome sequencing study ever conducted. Um, so that so that came on our radar as around 2016, 2017. I think for me personally, um, I, I moved to Biogen in, in, in 2018. Um, it was around the time the Pfizer you know, pulled out of neuroscience and um, Biogen were all in on neuroscience. So it just seemed like the perfect place for me to work. Um, but the first thing I was tasked with when I joined Sally John's organization was make UK Biobank useful for neuroscience, for multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease and depression and uh, Parkinson's, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it was a sort of a tall order. I mean, UK Biobank is breathtaking in terms of its, its depth and, and it's, just, it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful study. Um, but it, it's not a disease specific study. Um, and, a, and a lot of these diseases like Alzheimer's, you know, they only come along, you know, when you hit your 60s. Um, so there's not a whole lot of people in there, or there weren't at least back when I started working with it, uh, with Alzheimer's. So there was not that many questions that we could address using UKB. So, you know, I, I, the lowest hanging fruit for me coming from my background with the Enigma Consortium was to look at the MRI scans in UKB. Unlike Enigma, which was uh, retrospective meta-analysis, UKB are actually collecting um, scans across three different sites in the UK, all using the same type of scanner, the same head coil. It's, uh, it's all standardized. So, um, so that was the first thing I did. I did GWAS and a couple of new um, imaging measures from the brain scans, uh, things like uh, sulcal folding, you know. Um, and, but I, I was still, I felt like we could do more um, to help neuroscience. Um, and I started to play around with the idea that maybe we could look into doing neurofilament light polypeptide or neurofilament light chain in UKB. So this is like a neuronal cytoskeletal protein. Um, and when, when there's axonal injury, when you get neuronal injury, um, it, it, it gets secreted into um, fluids, so CSF or, or blood. Um, and it was proposed, it was really gaining, gaining momentum as a potential biomarker for uh, MS and Alzheimer's and other brain illnesses. Um, so it, it just seemed like a, a really exciting idea. What if we could measure neurofilament across UK Biobank, across these half a million people, and we could get a database of, of you know, how much brain injury do you have based on a blood sample? Um, but quickly realized that was going to be very expensive and a little bit niche as well. Um, you know, there's not, you know, there's not that many pharmas that are invested in neuroscience these days. Um, and we felt that if we were going to do it, we would need we would need it to be a multi pharma consortium effort, given its expense. Um, so thought about it more and more, and I, you know, had already worked with Olink um, on what the smaller scale this? studies. This what was, year was this about? This was 2018, I think. 2018, yes. 2019. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Um, but yeah, I have been working with the whole link on some smaller scale studies. I've done some work in a, a Swedish neurology cohort looking into proteomic changes in Alzheimer's disease and 
started to talk to Evan Mills at Olink about, um, hey, are, are you going to get neurofilament on Olink any day? Um, I'd love to look at neurofilament in UK Biobank. And we started to, you know, toss around the idea that, you know, maybe um, instead of just doing neurofilament in UKB, we could do Olink because it captures neurofilament and it captures many other proteins at the same time. So we could, you know, not just make this uh, about enhancing the, the value for neuroscience in UK Biobank, but just in general, enhancing the value for drug discovery and potentially opening this up to a, a wider consortium of, of pharmas. But yeah, that's a, that's a mouthful. Basically, I can't remember the question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> he asked you how you got started with the UK Biobank, and it's great because you zoomed right into sort of getting 13 pharmas together. That was no mean feat. What, what was it like? I mean, here it is. You're going from one protein, realizing, right, NFL's yeah. not going to be of general interest, and then some exposure to Olink. Uh, there must have been a lot of different conversations. Yes. Yeah. I don't know where to start. Um, well, if someone walks up to you today and they say, how did you do it? How did you yeah. make that happen? What do you say to them? Because you shared with me once that that was, that was a question you get asked a lot. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not. It was a lot of a lot of uh, it was a convergence of, of mm. factors, I guess, so to speak. Um, I think it was a mixture of, you know, it, w it was good timing um, because I had been involved on the exome sequencing consortium, which was eight different pharmaceutical companies funding that, and that was wrapping up, and we um, had a conversation amongst the eight of us of, you know, what would you like to do next? Do we want to do something next? And we basically took a straw poll of other multi-omics techniques, and proteomics really rose to the top. So I saw that as an opportunity. I was a huge fan of proteomics to make my pitch to, to that group of, uh, of companies um, and it seemed to to go down well but it was the timing just just happened to be right because the the field of proteomics was maturing to the point where these multiplex technologies could capture um, quite a sizable you know proportion of the canonical human plasma proteome um, and it just happened to be a time where um, the farmers you know, had budget set aside to do something innovative like this. Um, but yeah, and had a good network of people helping me out. Melissa Miller from Pfizer was a huge proponent of this alongside me and, and Lyndon Mittenall from uh, Regeneron as well. So lots of different people um, and just basically all coming together and agreeing that this was a good idea. I have to just tell you that I was talking to someone on a different interview, and I said Melissa McCarthy because Mark McCarthy and Melissa Miller <laughs> were both involved in this. So I just made that connection just now as you said that. That's funny. Now, timing-wise, you mentioned that you started talking 2018, 2019. If memory serves correctly, I think we there was a press release at the end of 2020, right, yeah. announcing the UK Biobank's involvement. So that must have been a very busy year and a half. <sighs> Yeah, I've always had these bags under my eyes, but they got, they got bigger uh, during 2020. Um, yeah, the first, the first, you know, proper conversation that we had about this was in Pfizer's New York um, uh, campus um, in, I think, May, April, February or May. Sorry, February or March, I should say, of 2020. And I gave the pitch there. Um, mm. And... Yeah, then everything shut down, the whole world shut down, so uh, the rest right. of the pitch was, was virtual. So originally we got six of those those eight companies you know, signed up, and then getting the other uh, seven on board was all, you know, meeting people for the first time from different farmers that uh, it was all through, through Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams or what have you. Do you think right. that Zoom, Zoom was an impediment, or do you think it actually, you know, because some things, oddly, covid and in, in the you know this push to Zoom and, and teleconferencing, kind of ushered in you know it, it ushered in telehealth. It probably brought us a decade uh, forward in using telehealth solutions. I'm just curious your perspective on whether you think that helped or hurt or was neutral. I have a silly perspective on this. Um, <laughs> I I like it. I, I actually thought it was helpful um, for two very silly reasons. I think the first is that um, I can be awkward in person and I'm not very good at small talk. So Zoom is very, you know, you get online and then you get straight into it. <laughs> oh, I've um, seen you in action and you do get straight into it. <laughs> you get um, things done. And then, you know, um, I'm short. I'm like 5'7", so nobody can see that on Zoom. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Those are two very valid reasons. Yeah. Cut out the small talk, and Cut height kind of is a deceptive I thing. Think sure. I just took us down a rabbit hole, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. about uh, multiomics. Uh, mm. How would you see the value of using multiomics in, in big cohorts like uh, UK Biobank? And what is the position of proteomics? How would you see proteomics position in this multiomics approach? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I uh, sorry if this sounds uh, a little of a heresitism, but I've given so many talks on this at this point that I'll probably say the same thing that I often do, which is that we've been using UK Biobank and FinGen and these, these big population biobanks to make links between you know, gene variants and diseases and then turn those links into new drugs. So Gene X is a really strong association with uh, disease Y let's turn it into a new drug. Let's, let's make a small molecule or an antibody that hits uh, the protein that's, that's, that's encoded by that gene. Now, that hits the protein, right? We're not measuring the protein, and that's, that's the issue. Um, we're doing GWAS, we're finding lots of new genes, um, and a lot of them are intriguing, but a lot of them are very difficult to drug. And a lot of the time, the, the gene association that we've identified, it's messy. I mean, it takes a lot of downstream work to pinpoint exactly what gene it is. Um, and oftentimes um, you either, you know, it's either not completely clear or it's very pleiotropic where, you know, mm -hmm. it, it could be affecting a lot of different uh, proteins or pathways. So really the, I, I always saw proteins as the missing piece between, you know, genes uh, and diseases in, the, in that genetics guided drug discovery process. The proteins you know, we could argue about it, about how much they represent drug targets now that we have gene therapies and siRNAs, et cetera, that don't necessarily target proteins. But still, you know, especially for bigger pharma, the vast majority of the drugs we're making are targeting proteins. So let's put our drug targets part and parcel of that genetic scattered drug discovery process. And then we have the potential to maybe reveal something mechanistic about how that drug is acting as well. I... Exactly, yeah. And from the... Uh... Uh, pharmaceutical drug discovery angle, uh, they intuitively sort of pick this up, meaning they accepted that premise that we go from genetic guided drug discovery to gene to protein to disease. I th I think I mean I hope I hope that they liked it. They seem to like it because they 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 invested in the PPP <laughs> project. But yeah, I th I think that it was a, it was a relatively. It wasn't a difficult argument to make because yes. I think pe people have seen, you know, there have been a couple of papers from um, AstraZeneca and Abvi and others, and they've looked retrospectively at their drug development pipelines and they've, they've basically assessed, okay, you know, which, which drugs made it to, to, to patients and which drugs failed. And then which drugs had support from GWAS or a uh, ClinVar association and which ones didn't. And there have been a couple of independent studies that have shown that if your drug target has supporting evidence from genetics, then it's at least twice as likely to actually succeed. Um, but there's a lot of un unanswered questions there. The, you know, there seems to be pretty good evidence. Yeah, okay, let's use genetics for drug discovery. But there's a lot of uh, murky stuff in the middle like we, that we still need to, to, to figure out. So I think that's where the, the multi-omics can help. And as far as you, the pharma proteomics project being, uh, frankly, a you, you can say it's a pilot, right? Because you're looking at one-tenth the size of the UK Biobank. You can also make the argument that, well, something like this has not been done at this scale before in terms of looking at 1,500 proteins. Hmm. Uh, what, were you pointing to other work that had looked at circulating proteins in genetics, like as far as Mendelian randomization, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a couple of, of big studies. Claudia Langenberg is one of the pioneers in this field. She's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I didn't prepare for this, so I'm worried I'm going to leave people out. But there's Claudia. Of course, there's there's, there's Carrie Stephenson in, in, in Iceland with Decode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, several different. Uh, there's the Scallop Consortium that we're doing this at a, I won't say smaller scale, because they've amassed quite a, a large collection of, of all linked data. Um, but just, you know, based on the old panels, so kind of 90 proteins mm -hmm. at a time. So there, there have been a lot there, a lot of precedents you know this definitely wasn't the first time anybody was doing this it just happened to be the the biggest uh, um so far so. so their appetite was whetted right in terms exactly. of these smaller studies they, they knew that this approach could work and therefore that was really a low risk decision do i understand that correctly um to a certain degree i think that there were two ways you could have pissed this you could have you could have pissed it to um to, to geneticists, or you could have pitched it to, to biomarker uh, experts or, or proteomics experts. And 
I felt that the pitch was easier to the geneticists because genetics for at least the last you know 15 years, if not longer, is used to doing things at very large scale. You know, you need to you need to do things in tens and now hundreds of thousands, and some of the GWASs are even in over a million now in order to pick up the biology, in order to pick up the the gene variants that are influencing your disease. So they're used to doing things at really large scale. I think that they don't need to be convinced of that. I think the biomarker folks are more about let's do it with precision. You know, I think that they still needed some convincing that we could do this at massive, massive scale. So, but do you think the, the NGS approach helped you to to make your your pitch to to the geneticist because it's an NGS, uh, you know, and maybe they are more familiar with this approach? How was your feeling? Yeah, I think so. I think I think a lot of folks had had used um, old link before. I think using the the prior sort of method, the PCR based method. So. Um, So I think I think that we'd seen some good quality based on those data and felt that you know that the jump to NGS would allow us to uh, to scale up like this. So. And uh, then wh that when is the next? What is the next step from the UK Biobank? What is the wh what's your ambition actually? First, and what's the next step of the UK Biobank? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so obviously it would be great to do all half a million and i think that we're talking about that we're having early conversations about whether that would be feasible financially more than sort of technically i think that it's starting to become technically possible but we have to talk about how much it would cost i think in the shorter term um we're hoping and i, I hope i don't jinx it by announcing it here but we, we have um received approval to do a, a smaller follow-up study in 2,500 samples in the UK Biobank. And these, these 2,500 samples have already been profiled using the Olink Explorer assay, but we're going to do um, three mass spec-based platforms from, from SEER and Biagnosis and Elliptica, as well as uh, Somalogic. And then we'll just have a you know very, very comprehensive um, characterization of the plasma proteome in these 2,500 people. And some of these people would have had uh, COVID before they entered the study and some didn't. So it's sort of like, let's try to... Um, capture as much of the plasma proteome pre and post COVID as we can. Well, that'll be so interesting, I think, to, to especially to see how the complementarity of these technologies, uh, you know, wins out in a big cohort like this. You know, what are you able to reveal? You know, if Seer has this this vision to to be able to to sequence the proteome, try and look at things that that aren't targeted, whereas some of the others are are, uh, you know, like we go after targeted proteins. And then I think these mass spec technologies are well established as gold standards and have advanced very far in the last few years in throughput. Right. Because you're looking at different things, right? In terms yeah. of what kind yeah. of overlap there is with the canonical protein or versus sort of splice isoforms and all the variety of portoforms. I mean, oh my gosh, there's what, 400 different types of post-translational yeah. modifications. I mean, you just start so multiplying when numbers people ask, together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When people ask you, because they've asked me this, Chris, how many proteins do you think are there, including proteoforms? What is your thought about that? I mean, I mean, it's just you can't have a wrong answer, right? Because we don't know. <laughs> It, it just gets it gets it gets kind of mind-boggling to think about because obviously on, uh, without the proteoforms you would expect there to be twenty thousand just based right, on the human right. genome. Um, but then you know that, it depends on how many you can capture in blood, right? Yeah. I mean, it's in terms of their how they're expressed in different tissues. Proteoforms, I don't know. Whatever I say will probably make me sound dumb, especially in five or ten years when they yeah, might yeah, work so it fair, out. But like five hundred thousand, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've said. That's what I said. I think I read somewhere someone made a good argument around that. Maybe it was Karsten. Maybe it was Jochen. I don't know. Someone. Someone said that, well, and I it just it reminds me of the that. speculation of how many genes were in the genome pre-human yeah, exactly. genome project, right? The numbers were all over the place. I mean, yeah. who would have guessed it would be a little bit less than 20,000? I mean, not that many, right? A lot mm -hmm. of people really thought it was a much, much larger number. 100%. Yeah, exactly. And, and then as far as uh, I understand that impending, or I'm sorry, already, we've got released the data in terms of the Olink first 1,500 Against the 50,000? Yes, yes. I think that they are on the uh, the research access portal now. Don't quote me on that. I do not represent UK Biobank, but I think that they are up Naomi there. Naomi told or, me Monday, or no, told me Friday that, that she said it, it was up there. So by the time this podcast comes out, I think you're pretty safe. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a yeah. several week <laughs> lag time here. So yeah, if we're yeah. looking at you know May 2023. 
the first sort of set of uh, roughly how many samples? It's probably about 54, maybe 52 after QC, uh, mm-hmm. thousand. Um, samples. 52,000 samples times some 1,469 or so, give or take, uh, proteins yeah. uh, analyzed by Explorer 1536. I mean, that's quite a data set for people to dig into. Um, uh, I think, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dale, sorry. I, I've been thinking about <laughs> all the posters at ASHG, right, in October that we were talking about on the podcast as far as how many there was, what, 19 or so abstracts of different types of work? Yeah, um, I try to, this is not bragging, I have to keep track of this so I can convince people that Janssen and other, and other companies that this re- is a return on investment. But yeah, I you think we brag. had... You should brag, you should brag. I think it was 19 abstracts and six six talks at ASHG. But what I'm really excited about the public release is that, you know, that, that that's obviously a lot of output, um, especially yeah. for a data set that's so new. But I, I don't even feel like that, that's not scratching the surface even. I think there's going to be so much more that, that academics can do. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of creative things that you could do with this data set that might not have immediate translational impact for drug discovery, but uh, academic scientists are going to take this and probably do something really revolutionary with it. So I'm I can't wait to... till next year's ASHG when these publications start getting into the literature, right? It's it, going to be it's, it's going to be all over the place again. Yeah, exactly. Is that because there's such a wide variety of different uh, phenotypes that they can associate protein level and genetics to? Yes. Uh, well, yes, to a certain degree. I think we, we've looked at mm. that. I think probably a lot of the companies have looked at that. We've done kind of an all by all, take all of the ICD-10 codes or the feed codes and then, you know, run a regression against yeah. all the proteins. And that's based, that basically gives you a crude biomarker study. And, you know, we've been using those results in-house. Um, but uh, I, I'm mainly thinking just about how there, there's, there's so much creativity out there in the academic community there's questions that you could address with these data that we probably haven't even thought of yet because this was uh uk bppp was like one project out of several on our plates in pharma so i think that fingers crossed um the academic community will have a lot of fun ideas well and you know we had pushed out a, a explore 1536 data set when we first launched that mm-hmm. explore platform and it was on covid and there have been publications spurred from that by just comparing those COVID data in that cohort over to, you know, whatever work the researcher was already doing to look at those different signatures. So those, you know, seeing publicly available data spur novel uh, comparisons and novel publications, I just think that's that's what it's all about, right? Getting these creative minds on it, crowdsourcing these ideas and, and how people debate ways to do things on Twitter. I just absolutely love. It, it's fantastic. You know, on UKB, I think you know, it, it kicked off in 2006. So it's, it's not a, a new study, but it always feels new. They're always mm-hmm. adding, you know, cool, innovative, new technologies to this data set. So it, it'll, it'll go on for a long time to come. Not for sure. And then as far as uh, you being, how do I say, that organizer, you were there at the beginning, you must have lots and lots of invitations to give these kinds of talks as far as UK Biobank and the PPP in particular. Yeah, yeah, I do. (laughs) Don't ask, why did he accept ours? (laughs) (laughs) I won't ask. (laughs) Uh, no, I, I do. Yeah, it's exciting. And I want to make sure that I spread it around. I, I guess I, I am the, the PI for the study overall. But, you know, there's there's no way this ever would have happened without a lot of other um, more talented and more intelligent people than me involved. So, um, yeah, I get invited a lot. But, but when when I can try to try to forward along to uh, to other folks who help build this as well. Um, Melissa, Ben Son, um, you know. Uh, Joe Sostakowski, um, and by the way, Brad Brad Gibson from from uh, Amgen uh, was a huge proponent because the consortium was ninety something percent geneticists. Brad mm-hmm. is the proteomics expert. Brad has the real background, the hardcore background Shops. in mass specs. So he really he he helped put guardrails on on this and make sure that we were doing things properly. Make sure I that would it was imagine he yeah. got the ball over the finish line too, right? In terms of that extra weight of somebody who is not coming from the genetics field, but within the pharma proteomics sort of context. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I think mm. you know I I have you know probably. Uh, built a little bit of a reputation in this study, but I had, I didn't really have any before I 
before I started it. And I think when I was pitching this idea, there was probably a lot of skepticism, like who's this little twerp and he has his genetics <laughs> background. So Brad, Brad being on board and, you know, putting his weight behind it. And, you know, Mark McCarthy, as you mentioned earlier, Cindy is involved as well. And, and Carrie, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of people um, that are more uh, prestigious than me put their weight behind it and really uh, helped, helped put it over the finish line. Well, they got behind well, your vision. That's got to feel good. <laughs> But how will you Absolutely. see, uh, I have a question now generally more for the cohorts, how will you see the use of cohorts in pharma and the drug development process? I mean, what is the value? And what do you think is uh, having different also ethnicities and uh, different, uh, let's say, from, from different places, the cohorts will help on that? What is your vision and how is your, your idea about it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that they're, they're the engine for... Uh, um, sort of epidemiological health studies, basically. Um, you know, for any sort of common complex disease, we need these population cohorts to gain a better understanding of their, their molecular mechanisms, the, the causal mechanisms, as well as potentially some of the environmental influences on these diseases. Um, so, yeah, I think that we've done a lot with UKB. There's a huge push now, a, a, a very well-deserved push towards looking into underrepresented population cohorts. So lots of different ones that we could potentially look into. Um, and also, you know, disease, disease enriched cohorts, cohorts that might have a, you know, a dementia wing, for example. I know that FinGen is building up its dementia uh, sub-study. So lots of different directions that could go in. Is there a threshold, a minimum threshold, maybe because of incidence of disease in these cohorts or something that, like, do you not tend to look at anything less than 10,000 samples or anything less than 50,000? Or you, do you look at each cohort on its own merit based upon, you know, are there, is there longitudinal data? How are the data collected? You know, what's your, can you share a few criteria that you think are important for selecting cohorts? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, actually, we've, we've started um, to, to think about this more objectively. Can we put together a list of criteria for biobank curation? You know, because now that yeah. the UK biobank used to be the only game in town, but it's you know, still probably, in my opinion, the best. But there are a lot of excellent cohorts coming out as well. I, the way that I, I think of it, and this is a little bit coarse um, and maybe crude, but um, the, the larger your sample size, um, the less detailed your, your phenotyping and your clinical information. And then the smaller the sample size, the more disease specific clinic, clinical phenotyping you can get. So I would say, you know, you could go all the way up to some of these medical records databases from Optum or IBM, and they've got hundreds of millions of people. And you can do some cool things with regard to, you know, comorbidity mapping in those databases, but you can't link to a specific clinical scale for depression or Alzheimer's disease, and they're not going to have neuroimaging or proteomics, etc. cetera. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have some of the cohorts that, you know, like I mentioned at the start, the, the Swedish neurology cohort that I was applying all link to a few years ago, that's got, you know, CDR summa boxes and mini mental state examination and all of these very disease-specific disease measurements that really help us drive in on specific hypotheses that are relevant to the disease and sometimes mm -hmm. almost use those studies like natural history cohorts or like control wings to clinical trials. And then you have mm -hmm. sort of the... I won't say the Goldilocks biobank, but I, I, the Goldilocks sort of approach, but I can't think of a better term. So, and that would be where the biobanks fit in. I think UKB, um, it doesn't capture everything. It doesn't have many mental state examination or CD summer, CD or some boxes, but it does have, um, fluid intelligence tests. It has trail making. It has a lot of different cognitive and, 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 um, you know, functional tasks. Um, Paired with deep genetic data and now proteomic data, actigraphy, imaging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think that finding that sort of, uh, you know, Goldilocks approach where we can get the, the power of large scale, but also get some of the, the denser clinical phenotyping is, is, is usually how we try to go about it when we're selecting our, our cohorts. That's amazing. Wow. That was really a rich answer. Thanks. Okay. Well, Chris, it was great having you here on the podcast this afternoon. Uh, thank you really so much for being so generous with your time and your thoughts today. We really look forward to seeing some results uh, and, and indeed, like you mentioned, the creativity of scientists. 
Oh, I'm very happy to be here. I, I, before I go, I do want to give a shout out to Evan Mills again for helping get this over the line. Um, and to Clev Diamanti and Philippa Pittengel, who did so much uh, technical and just, you know, all, all sorts of technical support and scientific support for the, the UKB project. So a, a disclaimer, we were- this was Chris's shout out to three Olink employees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in recognition yeah, for all the effort on this. But I'll yeah. also say that I think Clev has, and Philippa have both said that how much they appreciated how much they learned from the genetics perspective from so many of these thought leaders that are the scientists in pharma who are driving the experimental design and the vision and and gained approval to use the UK Biobank data. I think I think this idea of looking at pharma as a funding body, right? You you shared that with me before Chris that I mean these are heavy hitting scientists that have have a, a, an incredible track record of being able to to drive such rich discoveries so it's it's a it's such a privilege to to be around you all and and see this paper coming out um from these data that you've all you've all been a part of. So I, I look forward to that publication too. In case you can plug for it, I don't know if you know any timing around the, the UKB PPP paper, first paper. I, I, I resubmitted the revised version over the weekend. So fingers crossed. Someone else was working over the weekend then. <laughs> <laughs> the response to the reviewers was 29 pages long. That can either be a good thing wow. or a good thing. Uh, so a lot we'll of see. data wow. though. That's a lot of novel methods, I think. So, well, that's exciting. <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah. You heard it first here. Yep. <laughs> Plenty to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Thank Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. It was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. Thank you for listening to the Proteomics in Proximity podcast, brought to you by Olink Proteomics. To contact the hosts or for further information, simply email info at olink.com. Mm-hmm.